Hello. How's everybody doing? Thank you all for the hosts. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm wondering if the music is going to be like too soothing <laughs> for the story. Thank you, Riddy, Hammer, Terror for the host. And happy birthday, Riddy! It's Riddy's birthday, everybody, so please wish her a happy birthday. I'm so glad that she's a part of our fam. The tea is very hot. Gotta wait for it to cool down a bit. Um... <clears throat> All I know is, uh, this music is Jap by a Japanese composer. That's really all I know. Oh, and we have a boo-boo. Meow. Boo-boo well, wants to say hi. Hi, baby. What you doing? You want to say hi to everybody? Yeah, you're so cute. Yeah, you love the butt scratches. So silly. So silly, baby. Yeah. I don't have anything for you. Hope you avoided those types since last night. Um, you know what? I don't think any of them were in my dreams, so I think I did avoid them. So, so far, so good. All right, so this is gonna be a shorter stream because I'm supposed to have dinner with my mom tonight. I don't know how this is gonna work. Social distancing is hard and I feel like what we have done has been good up until recently and I don't know if there's even a point anymore. Not because I don't think it's needed, because I do think it's needed. It's just hard right now. Um, and it being Mother's Day and all that stuff. Um, anyways, so I gotta get going in about an, an hour and a half. Um, so we're just going to dive in and read as much as we can today. Um, just a reminder for those watching on YouTube that this was originally aired as a live stream on Twitch. So I will be chatting with my viewers because that's why I stream. Um, and these viewers are my friends. So um, to aid you guys, if you want to skip past the, the blah 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 chatting, um, there will be... <clears throat> timestamps down in the description box below um, so be sure and check those out and you can click directly on them to get to the next chapter and I think that's all my announcements really um, I hope you guys are doing great and if not I hope you're on the way to doing great um, this music is very very chill it's kind of sleepy inducing. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, we're gonna start chapter five. <clears throat> and I'm gonna go ahead and put this over my face. Cause I don't need to see my face really. I just need to know my timestamp and <laughs> I think I'm okay to start reading. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Chapter five. After a few moments of not crying, but a lot of blinking, and staring at her medications before stashing them in a drawer, Stevie emerged from her room to find that Janelle Franklin had arrived, and Nate was nowhere to be seen. Janelle was shorter than Stevie had pictured. She wore a red floral romper, and her braided hair was wrapped in a scarf of yellows and golds. She wore a light, summery perfume that trailed in the air behind her as she hurried over to wrap Stevie in a hug. We're here! 
she said, clasping Stevie's arms. We're here! Are your parents here? They left a few minutes ago. Are yours? No, Janelle said. They're both on call today, so we did all my goodbyes this week. Family dinners and friends, we had a picnic. Janelle happily chatted about the many events that had led up to her departure. She came from a big family in Chicago and around Illinois. She had three brothers, two in MIT, and one at Stanford. Her parents were both doctors. Come see my room! She grabbed Stevie by the wrist and led her next door, to a very similar room, but with everything flipped around. Their fireplaces were back to back. I'm probably going to need more space to build on, Janelle said. But I think I can use that table in the common room. Pick said I could solder out there. Can you believe we're here? I know, Stevie said. I feel kind of dizzy. I think that might be altitude, Janelle said. We're not super high. The highest point in Vermont is only 4,300 feet, and altitude should really become an issue at 5,000. But you may still need to compensate for the lower oxygen levels by drinking a little extra water. Here. She opened her bag and removed a fresh bottle of water, which she pressed into Stevie's hand. I think I'm just nervous, Stevie said. Also possible. Water is still the answer. And deep, slow breathing. Drink. Stevie opened the bottle and took a long sip, as instructed. Water never hurt. Is Nate here? Janelle asked. He was. I guess he went upstairs. How is he in person? Kind of like he seemed in his messages, Stevie said. Well, we're here in person now. Come on, let's go see him. Janelle had entirely changed the energy of the place. She was movement, she was action. Stevie found herself carried along in Janelle's wake as she hurried down the hall and up the tight circular stairs. Nate was in Minerva 4, the first one along the hall. The door was shut, but he could be heard moving inside. Janelle knocked. When there was no immediate answer, she texted. A moment later, the door opened a bit, and Nate's long face appeared. He didn't do anything for a moment, and then, with a barely audible sigh, he opened the door enough to let them in. Do you do hugs? Janelle said. Not really, Nate replied, moving back. Then no hug it is, Janelle said. How about salutes? Stevie said. Those are tolerable. Stevie gave him a salute. Nate's room was more or less identical to theirs, except it was already a mess. There was a rat's nest of cables on the floor and a pile of books. He'd been organizing his books just like Stevie had. The Wi-Fi here sucks he said, by means of greeting. Cell signal, too. He kicked at the pile of cords with a converse-clad foot. I haven't tried yet, Stevie said. Well, it sucks. The box nearest to Stevie looked to be full of parts. Just parts of things. Chair legs. Some kind of metal disc. Janelle went over and had a look at it. What's this? she asked. Do you build, too? Nate swooped down on the box defensively. I go to flea markets, he said, waving his hand as if this was just something that needed to be dealt with. I collect things. I like clocks and stuff. He closed the box lid and with it, any invitation for further comment. Stevie enjoyed Janelle's brisk, confident positivity, and she also liked Nate's grumpy demeanor. She had a little bit of both of these qualities, and she fit between them very comfortably. Tour starting... Picks called up the stairs. They're waiting outside. Come on, you guys. Nate looked hesitant, but Janelle was not giving up. I think it's mandatory, she said. Janelle, Nate, and Stevie made their way outside, where a large group of people was milling around in wait. Hayes and Ellie, being second years, obviously did not have to go. It looked like the group went from house to house collecting members, and Minerva had, may have been the last stop. Stevie looked at her fellow first years. She wasn't quite sure what she had expected, if she thought the students at Ellingham would all show up wearing lab coats, or they would all look like Ellie. In general, they looked like any assortment of people from any high school. There were a few people with glossy, perfect hair who had already clumped together through that strange alchemy that joins all people with perfect, glossy hair. There was one girl in a bright red and white Czech vintage dress with cat eye glasses, winged eyeliner, a red vintage purse, and a tiny red fascinator. 
She was the most dressed up, and her heels sank into the grass as they walked. There was another girl with green hair and a NASA t-shirt who handled the grassy terrain in her wheelchair with deftness. There was a girl with a sharply cut black bob, pale skin, and vibrant red lipstick who looked like some kind of silent movie star dressed in a formless but somehow unmistakab unmistakably fashionable gray dress and thick black belt. There was a girl in a stunning floral hijab who took a lot of pictures of the campus on her phone. There was a guy who never took off his cat ear headphones during the entire tour. Their tour was led by a student named Kazim Bazir, who spoke quickly and excitedly. Kaz had bright, excited eyes and the upbeat tone of a salesman who really wanted to sell you your very own deranged mountain retreat. Ellingham Academy was built between 1928 and 1936 by Albert Xavier Ellingham and his wife, Iris Ellingham, Kaz said. The right side of the campus, where our houses are, is known as Wet Campus because the creek turns and, the border and borders the property. The fields and classrooms and most of the other buildings are on dry campus. Of course, it's all a dry campus. No laughs. Tough crowd. Ellingham was splendid in the sunshine. That was the only word for it. The light fell like rain and droplets that hung in the air. A cloud of them surrounded the fountain that gushed merrily on the green, creating its own ecosystem of rainbows. The light found every nook and crook of the bright red brick buildings. It made the gargoyles seem to smile. It deepened the green of the trees. It made the statues... Well, it didn't do anything to the statues, except reveal just how many of them there were. Do you think these get less creepy with time? Nate asked as they passed yet another cluster of naked Greeks or Romans. I hope not, Stevie replied. Kaz led the group around the pathways, pointing out all the buildings and their uses. Albert Ellingham had been a massive admirer of Greek and Roman culture. This was evident from the names of the buildings. Eunomia, Genius, Jupiter, Sybil, Dionysus, Asteria, and Demeter. As they walked through the green, Stevie looked up at the Great House. Its name was simple and accurate. The Great House was a character in this tale, the first building erected on this spot, designed to meet the whims of the family who inhabited it, while serving as the center of a seat of learning. This was the home Iris and Alice Ellingham left that morning down this very drive. Stevie counted the windows on the second floor. What's up there? Janelle asked. You're looking up there really intently. Right there, Stevie said, pointing at two of the windows on the left. Those are the ones Flora Robinson said she was looking out of the night of the kidnapping. Who's Flora Robinson? A friend of the Ellinghams, Iris Ellingham's best friend. She was suspected for a long time because she gave a weird story that night. Her interview was really odd. There was no time to linger on Flora and her story. The tour was moving toward the Ellingham Library, a stone structure that looked a bit like a church with a large rose window, a spire, and a rounded set of red double doors. It's designed this way on purpose, Kaz, Kaz said. Albert Ellingham said knowledge was his religion, and libraries were his church, so he built a church. Inside, the library was cool and still, with colored light streaming through the stained glass windows. All of the buildings were impressive, but there was something majestic about this one. There was an overhang that filled about half the space, but once you got past this, much of the building was open, and you could see up three stories to the bookshelves that lined the structure. Elaborate spiral staircases made of wrought iron woven into patterns of twisting vines led up to the other levels. Out of all the buildings, this one should probably have been the quietest and the stillest, but this one seemed a bit... Stevie struggled to catch the right word. Wild? There was a loose wind spinning around and whistling near the ceiling. The iron vines seemed to genuinely crawl up the steps. The librarian, who seemed to have just run in, was out of breath. She wore a very professional-looking biking outfit, and her short black hair bore the imprint of a recent bike helmet. Hey, she said, sounding a bit winded. I'm Kyoko Obi. I'm your librarian. I also run a cycling pub. We all do double duty around here. Sorry, one second. She took a long drink from an Ellingham-branded reusable water bottle. 
We have about half a million books on site, she said, both here and in storage. We have access to millions more digitally. We're partnered with most of the Ivy League libraries, so we can get you more or less anything you require. It's my job to get you anything you need. Stevie turned that over in her mind for a bit. One good thing about being from Pittsburgh was that the Carnegie Library was one of the best in the country. Yes, they are. She had been able to get loads of books and materials there. But here, there might be things related to the case. Things not available anywhere else. Stevie wanted to stay, but Kazim was moving them on. All the way across the campus to a large circular tent structure that looked semi-permanent. This is the study yurt, Kaz said, pushing back a heavy flap that served as the door. The floor of the inside was covered in a mix of beautiful woven rugs and piles of pillows and beanbags. A lot of people sleep in here, Kaz said. It's for studying, but it has all kinds of uses. The girl with the bob laughed knowingly. A girl with sh short silver hair, a longer chunk of which poked straight up at the forehead, was lingering nearby. She wore brown glasses, white overalls, and a short tank top underneath. She had been trailing Janelle, Stevie, and Nate for several minutes. The sun, sun came out from behind a cloud, bathing all of them in strong, burning summer light. The girl tapped on her glasses, and the lenses darkened. Magic, she said. Transition lenses, Janelle replied with a laugh. Photochromic plastic. Vi Harper Tomo, the girl said to Janelle, extending a hand, and I am magic. Something flashed between these two that was almost visible to the naked eye, which caused Stevie a second of panic. She had just met Janelle. Janelle was her best bet at a closest friend, and already someone was coming into the frame. Which was a crazy thought. Stevie tried to push it out of her mind and focus on the prize of this tour, an inside look at the Ellingham Great, Ho Great House, the Ellingham's former residence. She had studied the photos of this house for so long, seen the floor plans, knew the history, but instead, Kaz walked them right past it. Aren't we going in? Stevie asked. End of the tour, he said, walking them past the walled garden and back into a clearing in the trees to a large, sprawling, modern building of raw Vermont wood and stone. It had a high, peaked roof like a ski lodge. This is the art barn, Kaz said. This is the only building that was added to the original campus, and it keeps getting bigger. They're adding to it now. The ground around one side was dug up, and the construction looked new. Stevie couldn't help but note that the building bordered closely on the walled garden, the famous walled garden that held the lake where the Ellingham Ransom drop had occurred. The garden gate was open, and people wearing hard hats were passing through. Stevie craned her head to look, but the tour was moving on into the art barn. There would be time she would get in. The art barn isn't just for art. Kaz said, while walking backward. Everything kind of happens here. Yoga and dance, meetings, some classes. Kaz was never so excited as when he was talking about the eco-friendly construction of the art barn, the bamboo floors, and the locations of composting toilets. Stevie began to twitch from anticipation. After what felt like an hour-long lecture on sewage, they left and walked back to the great house. When they stepped inside, Stevie stopped breathing for a moment. The house was built around a massive foyer with balconies on the upper floor, floors looking down over the space. Before her were the master stairs, sweeping up to the balcony of the second floor, and from there twisting elegantly up to the third. On the wall at the top of the first level of stairs was a massive painting done by the famous painter and Ellingham family friend Leonard Holmes Nair. The setting was the lake and the observatory in the background at night. Though that much was clear, the style was borderline hallucinatory. Iris and Albert loomed in the foreground of the picture, mythical figures in swipes of blue and yellow. Iris's short black hair seemed to spread from her head and weave into the branches of the trees. Albert Ellingham's face was merged with a full moon that hung over the observatory and spilled light onto the lake. They looked away from each other, their expressions stretched, their eyes pulling long, their mouths almost rectangular. Stevie had seen many images of this painting. Online it wasn't that impressive, but in person 
It gripped her and held her attention. It was disturbing. There was something about it, something that seemed to haunt the shadows in the background, something that seemed to be behind the observatory. This was painted two years before the kidnapping, but it seemed to foretell the doom that was on the horizon and that the observatory would be part of it. The painting seemed to preside over everything. Meet Larry, Kaz said, indicating a man who sat at the large desk next to the front door. He was an older, uniformed man with salt and pepper hair clipped into a crew cut. I'm Security Larry, he said. It's what people call me. It's what I answer to. I'm head of security for all of Ellingham. I already know all of your names. I get to know everyone before they arrive. Security Larry knows everyone, Kaz said. Security Larry didn't look excited by this interruption. We're very secure up here, but if you ever need us, you can hit the blue button on the alarms you'll see in the campus buildings and on some light poles. The rules here aren't hard, but you have to follow them. If you don't, I'll show up. I live just down the path of the gatehouse, so I'm always here. If something says keep out, that means keep out. It doesn't mean go in because someone dared you or because you heard about other people going in. Some of the original features of the property are no longer structure structurally sound. You may get in, but you may not get out. We've had people stuck for days, so they were starved and terrified before they were expelled. You've been warned. What does that mean? Janelle said quietly as Kaz waved them toward one of the front rooms. Original features aren't sound? He means the tunnels, Stevie said, and the hidden passages. On the right side of the front door, opposite Larry's desk, was a day room with magnificent painted panels depicting twisting vines and pale roses, all decorated in delicate raised plaster patterns in silver. The furniture was upholstered in violet silk, and the floors were covered in a massive decorative rug. This was an 18th century room the Ellinghams had imported from Lyon, France. The furnishings, the rugs, the curtains, and wall decorations all of it had been boxed up, shipped to America, and resized and assembled here. The next room, the ballroom, had a set of glass double doors, the panes set in an elaborate Art Nouveau style. The doors were partially open, so Stevie pushed them all the way and stepped into a massive room in front of them that stretched up two stories. The floor was patterned in black and white marble diamonds. The walls were slashed with floor-to-ceiling mirrors, sculpted and framed in delicate silver. <clears throat> the wall panels depicted scenes of costume players in masks. The floor-to-ceiling rose-pink curtains were like theater curtains. The ceiling was painted in the light blue of early evening, with the constellations and their representative figures all in gold. Most of America's high society danced in this ballroom in the 1930s. And this, said Kaz, leading them to a massive oak door, was our founder's office. The office had massive proportions. It was two stories high, but unlike the echoey main hall, this room was thickly carpeted from end to end in a lush, deep green, and over that there were Persian rugs. By the fireplace there was a leopard rug, head and all, that was obviously and disturbingly real. Long windows stretched up to the ceiling and were covered in heavy satin drapes that blocked the sun. The second story of the room was entirely bookshelves, with just a walkway around for access. The fireplace in this room was made of a rose-colored marble. Two massive desks filled one side of the room. One held six sleek black rotary telephones. There was a spinning globe that Stevie guessed contained the names of countries that had long ceased to exist, giant wooden file cabinets, and a strange piece of furniture with tubes coming out of it that Stevie recognized as being a dictaphone, an early 20th century recording device. Dictaphones were big in a lot of mystery stories. This was where Albert Ellingham worked out the plan to try to save his family. They had counted the ransom money on this floor. She could have spent forever in this room. But they were being ushered out again into the foyer. A man in a blue and white striped seat seer sucker suit with an Iron Man t-shirt underneath came bounding down the steps in a slow motion run. His fine blonde hair was swept to the side and bounced a bit as he came down each step. And now, Kaz said, to welcome you all, the head of the school, Dr. Charles Scott. Welcome, welcome, he called. I'm Dr. Scott. Call me Charles. 
welcome you all to your new home. I say I'm the head of the school, but I like to think of myself as the chief learner. Oh my god, Nate mumbled under his breath. As you're at the end of your tour, Charles said, we need to say... Oh, there's a typo here. We need to say a word about Alice. Alice Ellingham was the daughter of our founder, Albert Ellingham. Alice is technically the patron of our school, and we open each school year with a thank you to her. So please join me in saying, thank you, Alice. It took a moment and some gesturing for everyone to realize that this was serious, and literal. Eventually there was a mumbled, thank you, Alice. That was cult-like, Nate said as they walked back to the green where a picnic was being set up. Why did we just thank a dead child? It's all in the rules, Stevie said. The school belongs to Alice Ellingham, if she ever turns up. We're all technically here on her dime, so we have to thank her. She's supporting us. But she's dead, Nate said. Almost definitely, Stevie replied. She was kidnapped in 1936, but this place is hers. If she is alive, and if she appears. She'd be old, but she could be alive, technically. That really is a thing, Janelle said. I thought that was a myth. Really a thing, Stevie said. You said you know a lot about it, Vi said. Vi had drifted out with them. Oh, Stevie knows it all, Janelle said. Go on, tell us. Stevie had the strange feeling that she was being called on to perform like a dog that knew how to use an iPad. At the same time, she now had an audience of people who wanted her to talk about the things she loved. And that was a foreign and delightful feeling. The sun was warm and the grass was springy and all around her was the scene of murder. They were heading toward the green, but the walled garden was just there behind them. Stevie turned to have a look. The garden door was still open just a bit and there was no one, no one around. Come on, she said, I'll show you. Are we supposed to go in there? Nate asked. It's open, Vi said, stepping ahead. The garden door was heavy and black, and passing through it had the quality of a dream. They stepped into a massive, lush garden surrounded by a high, perfectly spaced ring of trees. The grass was a brilliant, saturated green. The great house stood at one end, with the low stone patio leading down to the lawn. There were small fountains and elaborate benches and planters. It was a regal garden, designed by people who took cues from the royal gardens of England and France. But there was one major thing that really stood out. Most of it was a giant hole, covered in lush grass. What the hell? Nate said. That, Stevie said, was a lake. Iris Ellingham was a champion swimmer. This was her pool. Albert Ellingham rerouted a stream to fill it, and there used to be rowboats to go out to that. Go out to that. She pointed to a knoll in the middle, where there was a round structure with a domed glass roof. That's the place the kidnappers had him go to to drop off the money, she said. After Iris and Alice were kidnapped, people used to contact Albert Ellingham with all kinds of theories. I think a psychic told him that Alice was in the lake, so he drained it. She wasn't there, but he never refilled it. It probably reminded him too much of what happened. He left it just like this. They call it the sunken garden on the map, I said. I see why. Explain the dead child thing, Nate said. The deal is this, Stevie said. The school and all the Ellingham fortune belonged to Alice, but Ellingham kind of knew she was dead, even if he couldn't admit it to himself. When two years had passed, he reopened the school. And people came, Vi said, after the murders? It was a one-off, Stevie replied, and it was still the Depression, and this was one of the most famous places in America. Free school from one of the richest men in the country? That was a huge deal. And no one thought the kidnappers were coming back. They'd kind of taken every everyone there was to take. So this school was supposed to be a beautiful thing for Alice to come back to. Albert Ellingham wanted the place to be lively. He was sort of making sure there were people for Alice to play with. That's really grim, Janelle said. Sweet, but grim. So, how many millions of people said they were Alice? Nate said. Before DNA testing, everybody must have claimed they were Alice. 
That was a thing, Stevie said, nodding. But Ellingham had a plan. Alice's nanny was devoted to her in the family. She refused to give up any details about Alice. Ellingham had a secret file made of information about Alice so that if anyone came forward, they would be able to check. What, like a birthmark or something? Stevie shrugged. That's the point. No one knows except the people in the trust, and they can't inherit. The people who run the trust are Alice's keepers. I mean, now they just use DNA, so the secret Alice file doesn't really matter as much. It's good to know we're going to the most morbid school in America, Nate said. Now let's go. I'm hungry, and I'm still pretty sure we weren't supposed to come in here. Again, Vi said. Gate was open. We probably should go, Janelle said. But this is amazing. And it was amazing. For so many reasons. April 13th, 1936, 8 p.m. Flora Robinson had a well-developed sense of impending trouble, a skill she had developed in her time working in a speakeasy. You had to be able to feel the ripple that went through the room when the police were approaching the door. You had to know a false alarm from the real thing. You had to develop the reflex to hit the alarm button at just the right moment, that button that tilted the shelves and opened the chute and sent hundreds, or sometimes thousands, of dollars worth of booze and glass down into a hidden disposal area. Do it right, and you save the club from closure and all the patrons from arrest. Do it wrong, and you simply ruined everything. Flora could taste fear and anticipation in the air tonight. She turned and looked at the little silver clock on the side table. Iris and Alice had been gone for a long time. She'd seen them off at noon. Usually when Iris took her drives, she was back in an hour or two. She'd been gone eight. No one had called Flora for dinner. This break-in routine made Flora extremely uneasy. There was trouble around, somewhere in this quiet mansion tucked up in the mountains. She sat on her bed in her room, hugging her knees, listening and waiting. Her keenly tuned hearing and the acoustics of the house meant she heard the arrival at the front door. Iris was back. She slipped out of her bed at once and went to the edge of the balcony to see what had kept her friend. Instead of Iris, the butler was ushering in a man. It was George Marsh, a close family friend and member of the intimate Ellingham Circle. Normally, George would have come in and made small talk with Montgomery as he handed over his hat and coat. Tonight, the hat and coat stayed on, and the two of them walked briskly and silently toward Ellingham's private office. George was a former New York police detective. Several years before, he had saved Albert's life when an anarchist placed a bomb in his car. Full of gratitude and impressed with his wits and courage, Albert called J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, and recommended that George be taken on as an agent. George tended to be wherever Ellingham and his circle were. If they were in New York, he worked out of the office there. If they were in Vermont, George would be moved up to Burlington to work on smuggling cases coming down from Canada via Lake Champlain. George Marsh was Albert's de facto security man, and tonight, Flora could see he was here on business. Off-duty, George was loose and gregarious. This was on-duty George, his step quick, his tone clipped. George and Montgomery were speaking in very low voices, but Flora could make out a few words. Thirty-five minutes. Oh, God. I was, <laughs> that, I was gonna do, like, a New York accent, and it just came out Southern. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to do a New York accent. Thirty-five minutes. George said. Have you... No, sir, Montgomery replied. No, police. Within a few seconds, he was ensconced in Albert's office with Montgomery. Police. Not a word Flora wanted to hear. She had to act. She went down the servant's stairs to the floor below and then made her way to Iris's dressing room by keeping close to the wall. She pulled a key from the pocket of her dress and unlocked the door to a large room, an oasis of comfort. The pearl gray carpet was soft under her bare feet. The long silver satin curtains were still open and pale moonlight seeped in, causing the gold trim and threading on Iris's Louis XV furniture to take on a gentle glow. Iris had so many things. Flora needed one object in particular. She started at the mirror makeup table. 
where Iris's extensive collection of cosmetics were kept in rig rigorous order by her maid. Lipsticks lined up like soldiers, French perfumes pleasingly arranged, silver hairbrushes and mirror tidily side by side. Flora tore into the drawers of powders, shadows, hairpins, creams, lotions. Where was it? Not in here. She moved on to the chest of a dozen drawers that housed Iris's gloves, hat pins, cigarette cases, sunglasses, and any number of small accessories. Not in there. She worked the room, steady and fast, drawer by drawer, until everyone was exhausted. Flora heard knocking on the doors down the hall and her name being called. The maid was looking for her. There wasn't much time. She had to think. Where had she seen it last? An evening bag. The pink silk one they'd gotten that day in Paris when it rained so much they had to run barefoot, barefoot down the street. Flora ran to the closet, opened the bay's door, and switched on the light. The closet was not a closet. It was another room full of racks and shelves of silk and satin, with beads and furs, with enough shoes to fill a store, all lined up on shelves. The, handbook, the handbags took up an entire wall. Flora scanned them until she found the pink bag. She yanked it off the shelf, snapped it open, and removed a Chaparelli makeup compact in the, in the shape of a telephone dial. The knocking was getting closer. Flora had to hurry. The maid was at the dressing room door, knocking and calling. Coming, Flora said. With only seconds to work, she shoved the compact down the front of her dress, wrapping her arms over her front to conceal any lump, and went to the door to admit the maid. You're needed downstairs, the maid said. At once, miss. Why? What's going on? I'm not sure, miss. Mrs. Ellingham and Miss Alice didn't come home, and Mr. Marsh has come. That's all I know. Flora pushed the compact down near her belted waist as she followed the maid downstairs. She would have to deal with its contents later. She was ushered into the office. She had only been in here once or twice before. It was the nexus of Albert's business, his private area. Tonight, the large room was strange, strangely close, the long curtains drawn, the fire in the fireplace making a sweaty heat. Flora, Albert said. His voice had an urgency she had never heard before. Did Iris tell you anything about where she was driving today? No, Flora said. Just that she was going for a drive. But she didn't say where. Was she going toward Waterbury? Burlington? Which way? I don't know, Albert, Flora said. What's happening? Albert turned toward the fire. Flora looked to George. She and George knew each other very well. Normally, she could read ex his expression in a moment. He had a wide face with a heavy jaw and big brown eyes, the kind of face that could take a blow, rattle a crook, or melt an infectious laughter. Tonight, he was a cipher. Please, she said. What's wrong? Where's Iris? Where's Alice? It's fine, George said. He was such a terrible liar. And what was the point of lying under these circumstances? If you could just go back to your room. I want to know what's happened to Iris, Flora said. Flora, please, Albert cried. The desperation in his voice made her physically cold. His secretary, Robert, shook his head, indicating to her not to press the question. Of course, Flora said. I'll see myself. I'll see myself upstairs, Montgomery. The maid was out in the atrium, fluttering around. It was obvious to Flora she was trying to find some business near the office door so she could monitor what was happening inside. I'm in desperate need of a pot of coffee, Flora said to her. Could you have one brought to my room? Yes, miss she said and skittered off. When the maid left to go to the kitchen, Flora turned quickly and silently to the ballroom next to Albert's office. These rooms had intentionally been built side by side because they were rarely in use at the same time and both bene benefited from high ceilings. The lights in the ballroom were off and the curtains all drawn. The motley black and white floor still felt rough and dirty from the weekend's revels. The staff had not yet cleaned it. There, under the soft padding of her feet, were the paper streamers, the gravel from the drive tracked in on dancing shoes, the endless sticky patches of spilled champagne. Iris had shown Flora a trick about these rooms. The mirrors in the room 
were interspersed with panels covered in wallpaper in a pattern depicting the characters of the Commedia dell'arte. On the last panel of the left side, there was a wall sconce in the form of a Venetian mask. Flora climbed quietly onto one of the gold chairs against the wall and stretched to reach it. She put her fingers through the eye holes of the mask and pulled down sharply. The wall panel tilted, exposing a space behind. Flora pushed the panel, which swung open on a well-made hinge. The ballroom in the office, while seemingly sharing a wall, actually shared a secret space, about two feet wide. The ballroom mirrors on this side were one way, and could be used to watch going goings-on in the ballroom. There were switches that could be used to make the lights dim and flicker, and tiny panels you could open to snatch a glass from a confused party-goer. The perhaps unintended second use was that it was a perfect place to listen to what was happening in Ellingham's office. Flora slipped along until she found the little door that led into Albert's office. The door was far enough away from the men and sufficiently hidden in the wall that she could that she felt she could safely crack it open an inch without anyone noticing, exactly as Iris had shown her. Most of what I hear is very boring, Iris said when she showed Flora the passage in the door. I wish he'd get a mistress and give me something better to listen to. Flora had a feeling it would not be boring tonight. The one that came on Thursday, George was saying. Do you still have it? Of course. That was Robert Mackenzie. Here. He handed George a paper. Look, a riddle. Time for fun, George read. Should we use a rope or gun? Knives are sharp and gleam so pretty. Poison slow, which is a pity. Fire is festive, drowning slow. Hanging's a ropey way to go. A broken head. A nasty fall. A car colliding with a wall. Bombs make a very jolly noise. Such ways to punish naughty boys. What shall we use? We can't decide. Just like you cannot run or hide. Aha. Truly devious. The envelope was postmarked Burlington, Robert added. A phone rang, and it was snatched from the hook before the ring could even complete. Albert Ellingham said a breathless hello. The men gathered around the telephone on the desk, and the responses were difficult for Flora to hear until George's voice broke out of the cluster. We saw your man, a voice with a strange, unplaceable accent said. You called the cops. No, Albert replied. George is a friend. He just came to visit. We know who he is, the voice replied. You've made this worse on yourself. This is what you do now. You gather up all the jewelry, all the cash, anything you've got. You put them in pillowcases. You send your friend there alone in his car. He drives east on Interstate 2 and makes a left toward West Bolton. We'll take care of it from there, and you'll get them back. Better move it. You have one hour from now. The phone went silent. Albert said hello several times, but no one replied. Flora chanced it and opened the door an inch wider to see what was happening. The men were standing around the desk, not moving and not speaking. I go alone, George finally said. No, Albert replied. It's my wife and daughter. You heard them, Albert. George replied. They want me, so I go. Robert Mackenzie had produced a map and opened it over the desk where the men were gathered. Here, he said. They want you to go east on Interstate Highway 2 and take the left to go toward West Bolton. It's a dirt road. The drive looks like it would take a half hour, maybe more, depending on what happens once you turn. So we work fast, George said. Get Mon Montgomery to start gathering things. Jewelry, watches, anything you can get. Why you? Robert asked. You're in law enforcement. You're trained. I'm cheaper, George replied. If Albert went and something happened to him, if they hurt him or killed him, that's international news. That's the president getting involved. That's the chair. An FBI agent no one's ever heard of? That's not such a big deal. It happens. They can't let anything happen to you, Albert. You're right, Robert said, and they'd also get no more money if that's how this goes. We have to move now, George replied. We need to get the stuff they want. Where's the jewelry? There are two state safes upstairs, one in my dressing room and one in Iris's. The combinations to both are left 5, right 27, left 18, right 19. Go, Robert. Get Montgomery to help you empty them. 
Robert McKenzie hurried off, leaving George and Albert alone with the map. I should go, Albert said again. George's voice was quiet, but it managed to fill the room and disturb the air. You need to listen to me. You brought me here for a reason. It sounds like they're ready to give them up, so we just have to be cool-headed about it. We play by their rules, but we play smart. I'll go, and I'll bring them back to you. I know you feel like you have to go, but you have to put your feelings aside. Albert leaned against the back of the chair and remained silent for a moment. If you do, he finally said, you have my life. I'll be satisfied with a stiff drink, George said, grabbing his coat. As he did so, Flora saw his glance pass in the direction of where she was hiding, but he didn't seem to see the tiny opening in the wall panel. He simply picked up the coat and turned back. Lock this place down. I don't know. I don't want a mouse able to get in here. You have a revolver? There's one in the desk, Robert said. You load it. You lock the, you lock the school. You get the staff stationed at every door. And you two stay in here with that door locked and that revolver ready until I return. If I don't show up by, say, one in the morning, you call in the cavalry. This is how we have to do this. This is how we bring them home. Crouching in the secret corridor, her head to the crack in the door, Flora felt her heart beat so fast that she grew faint. She slid down to the floor as silently as she could. Okay, that was a very long chapter five. <laughs> And my tea is not hot anymore. <laughs> Let's see. Chicago Gross. Oh, hi, Shannon. Yes, it's Rudy's birthday. Gaming community meeting. I do appreciate anybody's lurk. Oh, thank you for um, manually shouting out. Yeah, I don't have bots on on this computer because it's just it's too much to worry about. Um, so thank you for man manually shouting out. She's only been reading for about five to ten minutes. So you're fine. Hi, Joni. <laughs> just freezing this Oklahoma weather book. Okay. Yeah, it's cold today. It's probably colder where you are, because you're further north. Oh, okay. Easy task, draining the lake, no problem. I know, I, I don't know. My default is just southern, because that's what I'm used to hearing, so... Coffee. Coffee. I can only do that. That's That's it, and I don't know if that's right. Hey, ready? Howdy, buckos. <laughs> uh, happy birthday! Left 86, right 7, left 53, right 0, left 9. Her head to the Kraken door. Welcome for clapping. Thank you and thanks to Shannon who left for the meeting. How's your birthday going, ready? I hope it is good. Um, sorry if my mom is texting me. I don't know what we're doing for dinner, so. Okay, um, I may only get two chapters done. I don't know how long chapter six, and chapter six isn't that long. But I'm gonna keep going into it. There was a mini scavenger hunt. It's a nice day so far. That sounds cool. Oh, how are my audio levels? Is my music okay? Um, does it need to be turned up, turned down? What do you guys think?
Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just don't have the chance to check that, so. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, onwards to chapter six. Back in Minerva, the two other residents were slouched cozily on the sofa, with Ellie's legs draped casually over Hayes's lap as she talked about Paris. Hayes didn't seem to be listening. He was working his phone. Pix was sitting at the table again, but her tooth collection was gone, replaced by glossing Ellingham Academy folders and paperwork. You're back, she said. Okay, I need a few minutes to go through the basics. Don't you have to wait for David or something? Ellie said with a groan. His plane from San Diego is late, and the sooner we start, the sooner we're done. It's fast. But he's coming, right? He's coming, Pix said. Stevie, Nate, and Janelle took seats at the table. Ellie and Hayes remained in their huddle, and Hayes was still on his phone. Hayes, Pick said, just look up for five minutes. Hayes tipped his chiseled face up and smiled easily, setting the phone on the sofa. So, Pick said, consulting a list, welcome everyone to Ellingham. ID cards. Each of you has been issued an ID card. That card is programmed to give you access to buildings you need to be in. Ellie rolled dramatically off the sofa and onto the floor, where she landed face down. Fix continued. Visitors from other buildings have to stay in the common areas, so they can be in this room or the kitchen, but that's it. You all got the official Ellingham Rules of Conduct, which includes information about consent and respecting other students. No means no here, okay? Fix quickly scanned the list. Common sense stuff. No drinking, no illegal drugs. Any food in the kitchen needs to be in sealed containers and labeled for food allergies, but no one in here has a peanut allergy. I think we should be okay with that. No fires. Except for in this room when I'm present. Seriously, Ellie? No fires. Ellie groaned. Janelle raised a hand. Soldering? She asked. Fine in the common room. No one has a microwave, okay? No unauthorized leaving of campus. We have shuttles to Burlington on the weekends, leaving at 10 in the morning and coming back at 4. Alert me right away in case of a medical emergency in the house. There's a nurse living on campus. The doctor comes in three times a week, and security can respond to any medical emergency if you need immediate help. If you need to speak to anyone, you can speak to me in confidence, and we have two counselors on staff, and you can make appointments online or in person. I think that's it. She scanned the page again. Most of this you can read yourself. I said no fires already. Uh, seriously, Ellie. No fires, Ellie mumbled into the floor. Okay then, that's it. Everybody take a folder. Nate immediately grabbed a folder and scurried back to his room. Pix headed back up to her apartment. Ellie peeled herself off the floor and went to the table to lean in over Stevie and Janelle. Tub room, she said to Janelle and Stevie in a low voice. Both of you, 15 minutes, bring a mug. It sounded like a command, it seemed like a command. Ugh. It seemed like a command that should be obeyed. Fifteen minutes later, mugs in hand, Janelle and Stevie knocked on the tub room door. Ellie was in the tub, dressed in what appeared to be 19th century pantaloons and a corset. This alone would have caught Stevie's attention, but what held it was the fact that the water was bright pink. Shut the door, she said. We needed to have a little cocktail party to celebrate your arrival. She indicated a pile of wet used towels on the floor next to her as if it was a comfortable divan. Stevie wasn't sure where to start, really. The fact that they'd just been lectured about drinking? The fact that Ellie was in the tub, dressed in pantaloons, and dyeing herself pink. Or the fact that there was a saxophone leaning against the tub. That too. She decided to let the whole thing go and see where the conversation took them. That was a technique in criminal investigation when you, when you wanted to get a sense of someone. Let people talk, let them guide, and they'll take you to who they are. I'm just dyeing my outfit for tonight, Ellie said. Both Janelle and Stevie decided to sidestep the fact that Ellie was also dyeing herself pink. No need to state the obvious. What's tonight? Janelle asked. Tonight is the party, Ellie said. Here, mugs. Here. She reached around clumsily behind her and pulled out a champagne bottle. Mugs, Ellie said again, reaching out. 
But Pix just said Janelle started. Mugs! Stevie passed over her mug, and after a moment, so did Janelle. Ellie poured some foamy champagne into each. It's warm, she said. I only managed to bring a few bottles home from France, and it's cheap, but even the cheap stuff in Paris is better than most stuff here. Okay, I'm going to talk you through all of that. First, she raised her mug, and Stevie and Janelle got the hint that they were to drink. Skull. Ellie sipped heavily. Janelle looked into her mug. Stevie hesitated for just a moment, and then decided to go for it. She had only drunk a few times in her life, but if there had ever been a time and a place, this was probably it. And they could probably ditch the mugs in time. Probably. The champagne was warm and had a hard, mineral taste and fizzed up her nose. It was not unpleasant. Drinking, Ellie said, draining her mug. They know it happens. We're in the middle of nowhere, so that kind of limits what goes on. This is a real no-one-can-hear-you-scream kind of place. Janelle was still staring into her mug. She raised it to her lips a few times and was clearly pretending to drink. They don't really care as long as you don't get too messed up, Ellie went on, rolling to the side to adjust her wet clothing. If Pix ca catches you, she just makes you dump everything out. My advice, buy cheap, buy often, put it in another container. Most people get stuff on the weekend coaches to Burlington. The only thing to watch for there is that Security Larry has a bunch of narcs in the liquor stores who, call, who will call him if anyone from Ellingham shows up. They make things hard, but not impossible. Plenty of people on the street will buy for you for five bucks. But don't get caught by Larry, he'll bust your ass. Okay, next point. She poured herself a little more. Curfews. This one is easy. You can handle it a few ways. One, you can have someone take your ID back to the house and fake tap you in for the night. Works sometimes, but if Pix is in the common room and sees it isn't you, that's bad. Better solution, come back and go out the window. Again, Larry will bust your ass, but it's not as bad as drinking. The other security people, they vary. Depends on how hard Larry's been riding them. Having people in your room, not too hard. Pix doesn't really check very much. She's cool. She's also easily distracted. She's super smart, but her mind is always elsewhere. The way Ellie was holding her arms, Stevie got an eyeful of her tattoo. In fact, she was pretty sure that Ellie was holding her arm in the universal ask me about my tattoo position. It was composed of elegant script. The ink was very dark, and while there was no redness, there was just a bit of white scarring around it if you looked carefully. It was new, and extended from the inside of her elbow to her wrist. Um, this is in French. I'm very sorry to those of you who speak French. Mon coeur est un palais flétri par la coffe. Oh, who? I don't know. It's Baudelaire, Ellie said when she saw that Stevie was fully engaged. I got it over the summer in Paris. Do you speak French? She asked. I do, Janelle said. Well, some. I think it means my heart is a palace something? Debased by the crowd. Stevie had no idea what the hell that meant, but she nodded. I was reading this poem one night in Paris over the summer, Ellie said, elegantly turning her arm. And it just hit me, and I said to my mom, I've got to get it on my arm. My whole arm. And she agreed. We had some wine, and we went and found a place in the canal St. Martin. St. Martin? I don't know. My mom's new lover is a street artist down there, and he knew a place. Stevie reflected for just a moment on how she'd spent the summer. The majority of the time, she was working at the Monroeville Mall in the knockoff Starbucks. When not working, she read. She listened to podcasts. She walked down to the ice cream place. She bought mysteries cheap from sale tables in front of the library. Doing everything she could to drown out the politics. Her life was the opposite of hanging around Paris with your mom and your mom's lover giving, getting tattoos. Another thing, Ellie said. The cell, the cell service up here sucks. The Wi-Fi goes out all the time. How do we watch TV? Janelle asked. Stevie had the feeling that Ellie was about to say she didn't watch TV. I don't watch TV, Ellie said. Stevie gave herself a point on her mental scorecard. You don't watch TV? 
Janelle said. In the same way you might ask, you don't breathe oxygen? I make art, she said. I make machines, Janelle replied. And I keep the TV on while I build. I need TV. It's how I focus. Janelle looked to Stevie in a kind of panic. Stevie knew from their summer conversations that Janelle was not joking. She seemed to know every show. Janelle was nature's finest multitasker, someone who could talk, build a robot, follow a show, all at the same time. Can't help you, Ellie said, proffering the bottle again. When Stevie and Janelle de declined the refill, she topped up her mug. I don't watch TV at all. Never have. We never had one growing up. My house was always about making art. I grew up in an art colony in Boston, then in a commune in Copenhagen, and then in New Mexico, and then we went to Paris for a while. Where did you go to school? Janelle said. Wherever we were. The commune had a good, good school. If I could do anything, got rich or something, I'd start a commune. This place would make a good commune. So, tell me about your love lives. Ellie punctuated this command by setting the bottle on the floor with a clunk. Stevie felt a queasy chill. This was not her favorite topic. I broke up with my girlfriend, Janelle said, staring into her mug. That's when I reprogrammed the microwave. Creativity can come from things sucking, Ellie said. I was in a rut last spring, and I saw Ruta in a pawn shop in Burlington. I had to have her. I didn't have the money at the time, but I found a way. I made a little art, I got a little cash, I got Ruta. We've been together ever since. She patted the saxophone. I'll tell you something else, Ellie said. This place turns people into biz- oh, into bunnies. It's the isolation. Trapped up here on the mountain, snowed in. When the power goes out, things get freaky. What about you? This was to Stevie. The champagne bubbles reached Stevie's brain just then. Sitting in this high ceiling turret in the semi-dark with her new friend Janelle and this strange but amusing artist dyeing herself pink, she was filled with warmth and a kind of slow relaxation. She would just be honest. I never met anyone who I was really... I don't know. I don't come from a very interesting place. Like, my parents are... Do you know who Edward King is? Stevie asked. The senator? Janelle replied. That asshole? That's the one, Stevie said. Who? Ellie said. Edward King is a jackass from Pennsylvania, Janelle said. He'd like to roll everything back to the bad old days. My parents love him, Stevie said, leaning back against the radiator. They work for him. His local office is our house. Oh my god, Janelle said. You didn't tell me that. It's not the kind of thing you put in a message, Stevie replied. But I did what I could to help. I went into the volunteer document the night before the last phone bank session and changed all the numbers. They made a lot of interesting calls. Krispy Kreme headquarters, the Canadian Embassy, Disney World, the Scientology Celebrity Center, SeaWorld. Beautiful, Ellie said, tipping back her head and laughing. I love it. Ellie had removed her ring and set it on the rounded edge of the tub. As she laughed, she swung out her arm and knocked it off the edge. It rolled under the tub. Oh shit, she said. Stevie got down on the floor and reached around under the tub. As she pulled her hand back, something scraped against her skin. Be careful, Ellie said, putting the ring back on. There's some old pipes or something under there. They'll cut you. This seemed like something Ellie should have said before Stevie shoved her hand under the tub. Then again, Ellie did seem like the type who jumped before checking if there was a pool under her, and probably provided advice in the same style. So, Stevie said, that's where I come from, and my parents are kind of obsessed with me partnering up with someone. To them, dating is one of the highest achievements of teenage life, so... Understood, Ellie said. Then do what you want up here. Definitely, Janelle said. I mean, my parents are kind of the opposite. They're all about school. School now, girls later, and now I'm here, so... Janelle let out a long exhale. We should get ready to go, Ellie said, standing up suddenly and bringing an end to the conversation, just as Stevie had fully eased into it. Her clothes dripped heavy and pink. I'm coming for you in a few minutes. It's time for the party. Go get ready! In the warm darkness of the hall, Janelle and Stevie hungered for a moment. 
What the hell was that? Janelle said. I mean, I like her, I, I think. But the stuff with the poem, the French stuff, living on the commune, the no TV thing, I, I don't know. Maybe this is what we came for, Stevie said. Maybe, Janelle said. Something about people who make a big deal out of not watching TV. I guess I never hung out with a lot of art people. Do you think this Wi-Fi thing is going to be a big deal? Seriously, I need my TV. I'm going to have to figure something out. There has to be a way to get a strong connection. Okay, uh, I guess we get dressed. See you in a minute. In her room, Stevie confronted her clothes, pawing through them quickly. She had not anticipated a party situation this early. She was never exactly party ready. When people at school looked online for party outfits and looks, she was genuinely confused. There were people who seemed not only to understand these things, but to accomplish them. A striped top, a wide-brimmed hat, shorts for that special beach weekend, lipsticks for fall, jeans that were perfect for a hayride, pendant earrings for that holiday party, and snowball fight. Who lived these lives? The party outfit was going to be black shorts and black tank top. Stevie owned no jewelry. Her concession to the occasion was a pair of red flip-flops. Janelle appeared at her door dressed in a baby blue dress covered in lemons, with matching lemon earrings and a gentle lemony perfume. This was all acceptable from Janelle because it made sense. If Janelle could build a machine, she could build an outfit. Random discordant bleeding came from upstairs. Ellie was playing her saxophone, and one thing was clear. She did not know how to play. Oh, Janelle said, looking up. That may get old, fast. Is this party enough? Stevie asked. You look great, Janelle said, and it sounded sincere. I just, I got nervous. I wear my lemons when I'm nervous. A moment later, Ellie, still pink, still drippy, came down the stairs, nudging a reluctant and unhappy Nate. She had saxophoned him out of hiding. It was time to go to a party. End of chapter six. And welcome for joining, CJ. Let's see. Did you win your scavenger hunt, Riddy? <laughs> commune, commune, commune. Yeah, that sentence wasn't the best. <laughs> Welcome for joining. I've never watched TV, Dee Dee. <laughs> How are you, CJ? Welcome for clapping. Thank you for clapping. Okay. What's that about? You're okay? <laughs> You're enthusiastically okay. Also, for whatever reason, when I picture Stevie, I picture summer. I don't know why, but like with the black shorts and the black tank top, like that sounded like summer to me. I don't know why. Yes, I am okay in a sigh form. Okay. Well, that's better than not okay. Although it is okay to not be okay, but I'm glad you're okay. Okay, um, let me see how long the next chapter is. There's a lot of dialogue in the next chapter. It's about 16 pages. Um, I think I'm gonna try to go for it. Uh, maybe, I don't know. I'm trying to decide if I have enough time. It is so okay not to be okay, something I think about often. Uh, yeah, I agree, and I wish... It is something that I really believe, and I wish that somebody had told me that when I was a teenager. Um, sorry to get real deep, but <laughs> I actually saw... So we were watching HBO, and they actually had like this... It wasn't really an ad, but it was... I mean, it was in ad format, but it was, like, a bunch of people from their TV shows, like, talking about how it's 
okay to feel like depressed and lonely and angry and not okay during the COVID time. And I was like really touched by that. I was like, wow, I am glad. That's really moving. Like, I'm glad they took the time to do that because people need to know that like, there's nothing wrong with feeling terrible right now. Um, and you don't have to feel guilty and you don't have to feel bad about it. And if you need help, that's, that's okay. You can get help. Um, so they had like a, a call number and that kind of thing. So we were really moved by that. We were just like, oh, we didn't expect that. But um, it was nice to see. Okay, um, I'm going to try to fly through chapter seven real quick. Or at least get to the um, stop. There's like a halfway point. I'll at least get to that point. So and then I got to call it. All right, chapter seven. The slow summer twilight was falling and the fireflies rose out of the grass and bobbed around as pockets of people made their way to the party, which was being held in the yurt. The Ellingham Great House windows caught the last of the dying sunlight, the windows glowing orange and gold. Ellie led the pack, blasting away on Ruta in a series of off-kilter squawks that made the birds fly out of the trees as they passed. David needs to get here, she said. You'll love him. He's the best. As they went through one of the many wooded areas with statues, Ellie stopped for a moment in front of one of the statues, reached into her bag, and produced a small spray can. She painted the words, This is art, onto the torso in dripping blue letters, replaced the can, and kept skipping ahead and bleeding on the sacks. Someone has a case of the try-too-hards, Nate said in a low voice. The yurt was packed when they arrived. There was a hum of voices coming from within. Ellie peeled back the canvas opening and raised Ruta high. A group of people on a small sofa in the back cheered, and she joined them. Within a, mo within a minute, she was wrapped in a black boa that had materialized from somewhere. A first year was in this group, striking in black lipstick in a shaggy red dress. Her name, Stevie would pick up as the evening went on, was Maris Combs. Coombs. Coombs? And she was an opera singer. Oh, it's Anna! Stevie learned this because she was emitting high, clear snatches of arias. An intense-looking guy with wild hair who wore a massively oversized dress shirt, like something a painter might drape over themselves, was gesturing with a vape. Hayes was there as well, sunk deep into the folds of the sofa. Maris was very close to him, and they spoke face to face. Chanel scanned the room and found Vi, who was sitting on a rug with three other people playing a tile-based game. Let's sit there, she said to Nate and Stevie. It was as good a place as any. Vi scooted over and made room for everyone, and introductions were made. This is Marco, Deshawn, and Millie, she said. Do you like Castles of Arcadia? We were going to play. Sure, Janelle said. I don't know how, but show me. Stevie also didn't know how to play. Nate did, and this brought a bit of enthusiasm to his demeanor. He immediately started explaining the values of tiles, with pictures of grain and bricks on them, the importance of the various grain squares, why you needed to build by rivers and collect the tiny wooden sheep and cows, and put them in fenced areas. Janelle rem remained focused, but Stevie couldn't help looking around the room, and soon she lost track of what the game was even supposed to be about. A girl came in through the flap with a kind of queenly bearing. She had a crown of vibrant, long red hair, thick and curly. Stevie had met people with long hair, and people with curly hair, and people with red hair. But this hair was like a force of nature. It wasn't fully curly. It was stretched out and full and golden. It was less like hair and more like a weather pattern. Someone called out the name Gretchen, and Ellie hopped across the room to greet her. Stevie watched the girl stare down the group on the sofa, narrowing her focus on Hayes and Maris. She spoke to Ellie, then gave a massive hair flip, and pointedly did not join the group on the sofa. Hayes just cocked his head for a moment, and then turned back to Maris. Something going on there. Jermaine Bat, the girl from the coach, sat talking to Kaz, Kaz, though she also appeared to be mostly looking around the room. She continued to work her phone with an intense intensity Stevie had rarely seen. She does that show, Janelle said. The Bat Report. She's some kind of journalist. As the room grew louder and more crowded, it became clear that there would be no castles of Arcadia, 
and Millie, Marco, and Deshaun split into their own group, and Vi and Janelle got to talking. Nate and Stevie remained together, with Nate sadly gripping a handful of wooden cows. This is fun, Nate said. What are we supposed to be doing? Meeting people, Stevie said. Nate made a sound like a deflating balloon. You don't like meeting new people, Stevie surmised. No one likes meeting new people. I'm not so sure about that, Stevie said as she watched Janelle and Vi. Stevie found herself getting strangely nervous as Janelle and Vi talked, their heads getting a little closer together with each exchange, and the laughs a little bigger. A bubble of jealousy rose in her, and she clamped it down. It's true, Nate said. Everyone pretends to. It's just one more thing we're supposed to pretend to like. I'm a new person you're meeting, Stevie said. Nate didn't reply to that. So, she said to make conversation, are you working on the sequel to your book? What? It was like a spotlight had come onto Nate, and he was pinned to a brick wall facing down the guards. He squeezed his cows. I started it, he said. How many chapters have you written? It's not like that, he snapped. Why are you asking me this? What? I mean, Nate fidgeted. You don't just write something and it's done. You don't just do it. You write parts, and you rewrite, and you have new ideas, and you move stuff. I don't want to talk about the book. Okay, Stevie said. She pressed herself deeper into the futon until the wooden frame was hard against the base of her spine. Nate also shifted uncomfortably. They let me in here because of the book, he said. That's why I am here. Do you know how many pages I've written? I thought you didn't- Two thousand. Two thousand. That seems good, Stevie said, unsure of what was happening. It's 2,000 pages and nothing happens. It's all terrible. I wrote the first book and then I forgot how to write. It used to be that I would sit and write and I would go into some other world. I could see it all. I was totally in another place. But the second it became something I had to do, something in me broke. It's like I used to know the way to some magical land and I lost the map. I hate myself. He leaned back against the pillows and exhaled. So, no, I don't want to talk about it. Stevie nervously side-eyed Nate until it was clear he wasn't going to say any more. Then she turned her attention to the rest of the room. Hayes was sidling up to Maris. Before long, they were in intense conversation again. Stevie wondered about Beth Brave. She probably wouldn't be happy that Hayes was sidling up to other people now that he was at school. Stevie also noticed she was not the only person paying attention to Hayes and Maris. Jermaine Bat was watching the two of them carefully, and at one point lifted her phone and took a photo. The girl with the red hair, Gretchen, also appeared to object to what, was she, what she was seeing because she kept deliberately turning away. Lots of strings attached to Hayes, pulling in all directions. It's David! Ellie said, throwing up her arms and breaking Stevie's concentration on Hayes and his orbit. David, David, David! As David, David, David came into the yurt, the strings of light shook and a fragrant night breeze blew in. He raised his arms high, as if in triumph. Ellie sprang over and ensnared him in a boa-filled hug. He half-lifted her, and she wrapped her legs around his middle and stayed there, riding around. Ellie directed the triple David over to the Minerva group. He was tall, with a shock of partially curly, partially wild, dark hair that likely hadn't seen a pair of scissors in months. Many people in the yurt were casually dressed, but David was leaning a little more towards shabby. Cargo shorts with visible wear and holes, a thin dark blue t-shirt with a logo that had faded into obscurity, broke down looking skate shoes. In that first moment, Stevie had the feeling she had met David before. Something about him that had just that just had a suggestion of something she couldn't place. Something that made her brain itch. This is David, Ellie said from her position, clinging to his torso. He's the last member of House Minerva. Say hello, David. Stevie had a strange thought that she really hoped he didn't say hello, David, in reply. But that was exactly what happened. Another point on the scorecard. Maybe people at Ellingham were not so different after all. David's eyes, which were deep brown and bright, went right to hers, as if he had clocked her disapproval. His peaked brows peaked a bit higher into his forehead, and he gave a long, thin smile. 
He set Ellie down on the back of the sofa and dropped between Stevie and Nate in a space not quite big enough for him to fit. Ellie did the introductions as she decorated David's hair with loose feathers from her boa. David dug, dug into a pocket and produced a battered deck of cards. Pick one, he said, presenting the pack to Stevie. As he leaned in, Stevie picked up a number of scents. There was something low and funky that she couldn't place, along with the stale air from a plane. Stevie did not want to pick a card, but the pack was outstretched, so she pulled one out. Look at it, David said. Don't show me. Stevie eyed the jack of hearts in her palm. Okay, David said, tipping his head back, looking at the ceiling of the yurt. Is it, uh, the three of clubs? No. Okay, the six of diamonds? No. The ace of spades? No. David hummed. Nate shifted in commiseration, but Janelle gave an obliging smile. Ellie draped herself over the back of the sofa. Seven of hearts, he said. You should probably give up now, Stevie replied. No, no, he said. I always get it within the first 52 guesses. That got a little laugh from Janelle, but Stevie suspected it was simply politeness. Okay, David said, looking back down and taking a deep breath. Last guess. Is it the king of clubs? Stevie held up the jack of hearts. Yeah, he said. I was gonna guess that. I was just naming cards. He plucked the card from her hand and shoved it back in the deck. Stevie felt a burning rush of blood to her cheeks. Was this mockery? What the hell did it mean? Stevie could handle mockery. What she couldn't stand was not understanding. The earth was close and the air thick. Ellie gently whacked David on the head, sending feathers flying. <laughs> You're so dumb, David she said affectionately. She gave Stevie a reassuring smile over his head. I was starting to worry you weren't coming. I almost didn't make it, he said. Then to everyone, he said, I was a little distracted last year. You sat in his room and smoked weed and played video games, Ellie clarified. You make it sound like I was doing nothing, David replied. It was all research. David makes video games, Ellie said, or he says he does. So, David said. Who are you people? More introductions went around, thanks to Janelle. Nate was again singled out as the one who wrote that book that one time, and then they got to Stevie. She researches crime, Janelle said. Researches crime? He repeated. What does that mean? What it sounds like, Stevie said. You watch a lot of Discovery ID? He said. She did watch a lot of Discovery ID as it happened. That was the all-murder channel. She did not say this, though. She does criminology and things like that, Janelle said, maybe a little defensively. And she knows everything about the Ellingham case. That's why she's here. What? Are you here to solve it? He asked. Stevie gulped in some air. Yes, that was kind of the plan, but no one else was supposed to say it, and they really weren't supposed to say it like that. It was like he had just taken her dreams, which had been floating so gently and rising so high this whole day, and with one prick of a pin, popped them, exploded them. Rubbery dream pieces all over the yurt. You weren't gonna say that, were you? He said. His eyes were so bright, so piercing. There was an awkward pause in their corner. To end it, Ellie tipped herself off the edge of the sofa into David's lap. I thought that was solved, she said to Stevie. Wasn't it? Didn't someone confess? Someone was found guilty. Stevie said. He probably didn't do it. He confessed because... A burst of laughter from behind. And Ellie looked up to see what was going on. No one wanted to hear why Anton Borchek, the local anarchist who was arrested and tried for the crime, confessed. He confessed because he was on the stand. Stevie tried to continue. Unlike before, when everyone was listening, now there was a dance breaking out and David was doing this weird smirk. And Janelle, Vi, and Nate looked vaguely uncomfortable. You know when your moment is over. A flask appeared from somewhere. Ellie had some. David passed. It was waved in Janelle, Nate, and Stevie's direction, and they all shook their heads. Stevie thought drinking from containers other people drank, w drank from was gross. She embraced Locard's exchange principle. Every contact leaves a trace, meaning in this case, backwash. Ellie and David went away to talk to some other second years, leaving the first years on their own. He seems fun, Janelle said with forced brightness. Nate was unable to bring himself to lie. I feel kind of better, he said to Stevie. 
I think you're even more screwed than I am. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and finish it. Night always brought the worry. Night was hard. It was three in the morning and Stevie was wide awake. If she was gonna have a panic attack, it would likely be tonight. New school, new start, new friends, new home up here on the mountain where, when she'd never been away from home and her parents for more than a few days. The night brought cooler air, but still, the room felt a bit crowded. When she opened the window, a giant moth blew in. It beat a hasty path to the ceiling light and landed against it with a thunk. I know the feeling, Stevie said to it. The panic attacks had started when she was 12 years old. No one knew why. Her parents tried to help, but were largely confused by them. Medication took care of some of it, but Stevie had worked out the rest with some assistance from the school counselor, and by reading more or less the entire internet. It had been a year and three months since Stevie stopped having the pa panic attacks all the time, and at least six months since she'd had a big one. But the night still worried her. She still paced before she slept, eyeing her bed, wondering if this was going to be one of the nights she was dragged out of sleep by a heart racing like a car with no driver and a board pressed up against the gas pedal. She sat on the floor beneath the window, closed her eyes, and let the breeze play on the back of her neck. Breathe in. Breathe out. Count. One. Breathe in. Breathe out. Two. Just let the thoughts come and go. You weren't going to say that, were you? Let it go. You can always come home. Let it go, for real. Go full frozen. You're even more screwed than I am. She opened her eyes and looked over at her Baru. She could take an Ativan and knock herself out, but she would be groggy tomorrow. No, she was going to do this. It was going to be fine. So she turned to her other medicine, her mysteries. Stevie had always loved mysteries from the time she was small. When the attacks hit, she found that mysteries were her salvation. If she was awake at night, she had her mystery novels, her true crime books, her shows, her podcasts. Maybe most people wouldn't be soothed by reading about the acid bath murders, but about Lizzie Borden or H.H. H. Holmes, about highway murders, about the quiet neighbor with the dark secret, about bodies in the walls and latent fingerprints, about 13 guests at dinner when you know they can't all live. These things were problems for her mind to work on, and when her mind worked on the mystery, it couldn't panic. So Stevie became a mystery machine, with true crime playing in her ears between classes at school and while she filled bean containers at the coffee shop at the mall. She couldn't get enough. She got into the web sleuth world online. There she found people like herself, people who spent their time looking into cold cases. It was there that she became transfixed by the Ellingham case. Yes, the idea of her solving this case sounded improbable. She was a 16-year-old from Pittsburgh. This case was decades old. Everyone had tried to solve it. The FBI hadn't been able to do it. The scores of serious and not serious investigators had not been able to do it. Thousands of people obsessed over it all the time. Ellingham himself, a genius, had tried to find out what happened and the search had killed him. You didn't just solve the Ellingham affair. She stared at the walls with their thick paint and their possible secrets. She wasn't screwed. She was Stevie Bell, and she had gotten into Ellingham Academy on her own. They didn't exactly admit people by mistake. Unless it was a mistake. What if they'd made a mistake? What if they'd made the first mistake they'd ever made? Why had they done this to her? Nope, nope, nope. Stevie put on a podcast and pushed across the floor and opened up a still-sealed box. She pulled out several thick folders full of perfectly organized printouts and copies, a roll of heavy-duty tape, and a pair of heavy-duty scissors. Once the box was empty, she set about breaking it down into flat pieces, trimming off the flaps to make the rectangles nice and even. She worked quickly, her mind split between the podcast and her task. In police procedurals, there was always a case board, a place to store the images of victims and suspects, maps and diagrams, a visual reference when you needed to think it all through. The box was ser would serve as a board. At the top, she put three photos, Iris Ellingham, Alice Ellingham, and Dottie Epstein. Here were the floor plans of the great house at the time of the kidnapping. The case board began to take shape as it filled. In the center of her board, C.V. put the most notorious piece of evidence of all, the one people always talked about, the truly devious letter. Look, a riddle. Time for fun. 
Should we use a rope or gun? Knives are sharp and gleam so pretty. Poison's slow, which is a pity. Fire is festive, drowning slow. Hanging's a ropey way to go. A broken head, a nasty fall, a car colliding with a wall. Bombs make a very jolly noise, such ways to punish naughty boys. What shall we use? We can't decide. Just like you cannot run or hide. Aha, truly devious. The physical letter was lost in the mess of the investigation, so it could never be tested or fingerprinted. Only a photo remained, a stark, terrifying communication that arrived at the Ellingham house a week before the kidnapping. It had been composed with words cut out of magazines and newspapers, that creepy classic style of hiding your handwriting. Of the many intriguing aspects of the Ellingham affair, this was the one she always came back to, this strange declaration from an unknown person that said, I am bad, I intend to do harm, I am harming you now by inspiring fear. I am the knife, I am truly devious. It was like trolling, kind of, except so complicated. It took more effort to get under the skin of a famous person in the 1930s. They had to get a collection of magazines and newspapers, find the words they needed, clip them delicately, and glue them with a crooked precision, then send it off in the mail, never knowing, never knowing what effect it would cause. Why announce yourself truly devious? Why tell them you're coming? Stevie added another photo to the board, Anton Voracek. It was the truly devious letter that always convinced Stevie and other people that Voracek was innocent. Voracek could barely speak English. He probably wouldn't have written a poem in English, a poem modeled on the style of Dorothy Parker, no less. No one ever thought it made sense, but they found the marked bills on Voracek. No one liked him, and he confessed on the stand. Truly devious hung over the case like a ghoul. Over the next hour, Stevie assembled the, the images, organized the files. There were floor plans, copies of interviews, police reports. It had taken a very long time, a helpful librarian and the assistant of other, assistance of other web sleuths to collect it all. She had run through two toner cartridges and a box of paper that belonged to the Edward King campaign, good, to print out this mass of information. And it was a mass. It was heavy. Stevie liked to hold the files and bundles of paper, to pour over it again and again until it all ran through her head like an ancient stream. Surely other people had come to Ellingham with an interest in the case. Some of those people came before the internet existed, so they wouldn't have access to all Stevie did. And the others... No, none had her passion. You know when you're the top fan, the one who knows the words and feels the gaps and senses the disruptions. You know when you are the one who gets it. It was dawn when Stevie finished assembling her board and putting all of her documents in order on her desk and in the bookcase. She went to the window and found a soft, friendly morning with a light, sweet breeze. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath. The critical scene of the mystery is when the detective enters. The action shifts to Sherlock's sitting room. The little Belgian man with the wax mustache appears in the lobby of the Grand Hotel. The gentle old woman with a bag of knitting comes to visit her niece when the poison pen letters start going around the village. The private detective comes back to the office after a night of drinking and finds the woman with the cigarette and the veiled hat. This is when things will change. The, detec the detective had arrived at Ellingham Academy. Okay, and that's where I'll stop even though I have a um, flashback to read. Um, but... That is where I will pick up. So I'll just have to pick up at that flashback. Um, but we made good progress. We're over 100 pages in. Um, so these aren't actually going to take as long to read as I thought. Especially if I'm doing a lot of read streams per week. But anyways, um, let me see... Flying, zippy zoom. No, no settlers of Arcadia castles in Catan. I know. <laughs> oh my gosh, I was going to say hello, hello, David Elamio. I mean, like I did to myself while listening from across the room. <laughs> Am I a bad person? No, you're not a bad person. She became a Scooby Doo van. Welcome for clapping. Um, yay for read streams. Thank you all for being here. Um, let me see what I have on the schedule next.
so tomorrow night, oops, after Nicole and Oxel stream, so tomorrow there's a lot going on. So V and Holland are doing their best Friends Day, and then after that, Nox will stream. And then after they're done, I'm going to um, stream the rest of mid. So, or at least part two of mid, wherever I left off last. Um, so I don't know if I'm, I'm excited or not, but I just want it to be over, <laughs> honestly. Anyways, you, David. I have enjoyed what I've heard so far. I'm glad you're enjoying it. And then I'll do another read stream on Thursday. So, um, I'll leave you guys here. Thank you all for being here. I hope you have a great night. And take care of yourself. I love you all. High praise for mid. Mm -hmm. I'll see you later. Bye.